Hello, I'm Tom Hauser. This is a debate between the major party candidates for Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District. The 3rd District includes a large portion of Hennepin County and part of Anoka County. It wraps around Minneapolis, including cities like Coon Rapids, Maple Grove, Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, Edina, Bloomington, among others. Now, both major party candidates are here. Eric Paulson is a Republican and the incumbent in this race. He is a graduate of Chaska High School and earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics from St. Olaf College. Paulson worked as a business analyst for Target. He got his start in politics working for Senator Rudy Boschwitz and then for Congressman Jim Ramstead. Paulson spent seven terms in the Minnesota House, serving four years as majority leader. When Jim Ramstead retired from Congress in 2008, Paulson was elected to replace him. Brian Barnes is the DFL candidate in this race. Barnes graduated from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and served 11 years in the Navy Reserve. He went on to earn a Master's of Business Administration degree from Washington University in St. Louis. Barnes currently runs the global sales and marketing department for a Minnesota-based company. And I want to thank both of you for agreeing to uh, appear on this debate here on 5 Eyewitness News. I think it's very important that uh, the voters in your district get an idea of where you both stand on important issues. And let's get started right away because we've got about a half hour. There are no time limits, but I would ask you to keep your responses as brief as possible so we can cover as much ground as possible. Let's begin by talking about what everybody's been talking about in politics uh, in the last uh, weeks. Uh, Mitt Romney and the 47 percent issue. He was caught on tape as saying that 47 percent of voters, no matter what, are going to vote for Barack Obama. He said he can't worry about them. And he says those 47 percent are, quote, dependent on government. They pay no taxes. And they believe they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, you name it. Now, Eric Paulson, some Republicans have at least endorsed the notion of what Mitt Romney was saying, if not the precise way he said it. Where do you stand on what he said? Well, I think it's important to point out here that I think uh, we've had one of the worst economic recoveries coming out of this recession than we've had ever since World War II. And I think there are a lot of people that have become, unfortunately, more self-reliant on government services. We need to do all we can to be helping produce more jobs in this economy, to allow small businesses to expand, to make sure people are self-sufficient. That means tax reform. Uh, that means tax reform to actually grow the economy. That's going to help our budget deficits. It's going to help uh, lift people up out of poverty. Uh, we've got too many people on food stamps right now. So I think probably the governor's comments probably relate to some of those issues. But I am focused on growing the economy more than anything else. Does Mitt Romney, is he trying to get at uh, the fact that he thinks that there is too much of an entitlement mentality in this country? And where do you stand on that? Well, look, first of all, I, I truly believe that as an elected representative, it's your job to represent everybody, not just those people who put you in office. And when I look at uh, the economy, what we really need to do is grow it and create jobs. Now, I've worked in business. Uh, you know, my background, as you mentioned, is in uh, Minnesota manufacturing where we sell all over the world. And it's important that we replicate that model and really work on putting people back to work. Because at the end of the day, when everybody's bringing home a paycheck, there's not much that we can't solve. Now, Republicans this week uh, fired back on the critics of Mitt Romney by saying that in unguarded moments, uh, Barack Obama has been quoted as saying he believes in a redistribution of wealth and that during the 2008 presidential campaign, he criticized especially rural voters who cling to their guns and Bibles. Is, is there much of a difference uh, between these unguarded moments that these candidates, uh, where they make these statements, and is too much being made of this? Well, I, I would say too much is being made of it because, you know, again, at the end of the day, you need to represent everybody. And this divisiveness, this partisanship is really what's tearing this country apart and tearing uh, Congress apart. And I, need, I, I truly believe that we need to look at it uh, as Paul Wellstone did and say we all do better when we all do better and uh, really focus on it from that angle. Mr. Paulson, do you believe a lot of Democrats uh, believe that there should be redistribution of wealth? Well, I'm sure that there are some that focus on those issues. I will say this, though, that uh, I agree with the perspective of uh, representing everyone in your community. So when I was elected to Congress, I want to make sure that I focus on everyone's attention. So I'm always sort of in listen and learn mode, and I have a very open-door policy. I also think it's very important to point out that uh, in helping grow the economy, creating small business jobs, uh, uh, that should be the focus. And so this, it, you know, partisan politics has been the rancor in Washington. It's part of a broken Washington that needs to be fixed, absolutely. I focused a lot of time and attention on building relationships across the aisle. 
uh, working with Senator Klobuchar, working with other members of the Minnesota delegation to be productive, to be results oriented. I think that's what Minnesotans more than anything are looking for in their government. And Mr. Barnes, in January, a 2.3 percent uh, tax will be put in place on the medical uh, device industry. It's part of the Health Care Reform Act and it could have a very big impact on Minnesota employers who are involved in the medical device industry. Your opponent is a leading proponent of repealing that tax. Where do you stand on that? I actually agree that it should be repealed because you've got a great opportunity to help businesses right here in Minnesota. And, and as we look at the medical device industry here in the third, it's extremely important to our district. Now, where I disagree with Congressman Paulson is I think he could have reached across the aisle and funded it in a in a more bipartisan way look the the bill is pretty straightforward in making sure that uh, the medical device tax gets repealed but if he truly wanted to show bipartisanship and make sure that it rocketed through both uh, chambers of the house as well as have the president sign off on it he would have found a bipartisan way to fund it not a partisan way to fund it you've called this a ticking time bomb if, yeah. if you do repeal it it would leave a, a hole in, in the budget to pay for health care reform, how would you replace it? Well, this is a tax that is going to hit Minnesota hard. This is one of our best Minnesota and American success stories. We should protect these jobs. They're high-paying jobs. They provide life-saving, life-improving technologies for patients in this country and around the world. Uh, the bill that we passed in the House had strong bipartisan support had every member of the Minnesota delegation, Republican and Democrat, voting for it, 37 mem uh, members of the Democrat caucus uh, in the House voting for it. The pay for simply was making sure that anyone that's uh, going to get a federal subsidy out of the new health care law and they weren't entitled to that would have to pay it back. Uh, the president actually has already signed off on a part of that for part of a uh, earlier bill that passed on this 1099 appeal uh, repeal provision. So I think we've already laid the groundwork to actually do this in a bipartisan manner in the Senate. How Hopefully. would you prefer to, to pay for it? You know, I, I think that we can look at things uh, like repealing part of the subsidies that we give big oil. Talk about a bipartisan way that could shoot straight through both houses, get the president's signature. Everybody would be happy. It'd be a win-win all across the board. Let's talk about health care reform more broadly. Uh, Mr. Paulson, do you uh, favor a, a full repeal of what has become known as Obamacare, which is actually the Affordable Care Act, the health care reform? Or are there parts of it that you would like to keep? As Mitt Romney recently said, uh, there's a couple elements, uh, the pre-existing conditions uh, element to it and the dependent coverage. Where do you stand on that? Well, first of all, I think the whole Obamacare uh, uh, concept is going to fall of its own weight. The costs have doubled. Uh, it's an extra trillion dollars. We've got an independent payment advisory board that's going to control Medicare decisions on rationing care down the road. I think that's very wrong direction to go. Uh, from my perspective, Congress missed an opportunity to do health care in, in the right way. And that's what happens when you ram something through in a partisan uh, fashion. Uh, and, and so uh, the direction I think we need to go, it's medical liability reform, it's having risk pools for small businesses to pool together, and it's allowing competition so you can buy health insurance anywhere uh, around the country rather than just in your own state. Are there any elements of it, though, that you would favor keeping? Sure, keeping people uh, uh, dependence on your parents' policy through age 26, strong bipartisan support for that. You know, that wasn't really part of the health care law, as well as covering pre-existing conditions. The Republican alternative also covered pre-existing conditions, and I support that. And where do you stand? You know, I, I look at it and I see a lot that we can agree on. As Congressman Paulson said, you know, covering pre-existing conditions, covering uh, young people a little bit longer, and also making sure that women don't pay a higher premium than men. I, I think those are all great things. But I also think that uh, the Affordable Care Act was a great step forward. Now, when I look at what's going on in Congress, I see a big problem. Congress has taken... 33 votes, 33, Tom, to repeal this and at the cost of 80 or $50 million and 80 hours of legislative time. Now, to me, that's a huge waste when you could be spending that time, spending that money, talking about a creative way to move forward. You know, it, it's not perfect. The Affordable Care Act isn't perfect, and I'll be the first to agree. We need some ways to control costs a little bit better. But it is something that we need to walk forward on not sit here and regress and say, you know what, we should tear the whole thing down. And the Supreme Court ruling that validated essentially came out and called uh, the mandate on the health care reform a tax. Uh, do you believe it is a tax and is it going to be a burden on taxpayers in this country? Look, it, it's going to be much better for everyone when uh, we've got more people covered by health care. A healthy society helps businesses thrive. And at the end of the day, again, we need to find creative ways to move forward, not sit here and regress and talk about how things could have done better. True leadership says, you know what, 
forward is the right direction, not going backward. Congressman, when people talked about health care reform, a lot of people were hoping that we're going to be uh, legislate, there was going to be legislation passed that would control the cost of health care. What this bill has done is covered a lot more people, obviously, right. but has it done enough to lower the cost of health care? No, in fact, uh, the Congressional Budget Office says it's, it's uh, accomplishing the opposite of help, helping raise costs. And so it's certainly expanded access through a government program. And that's probably the biggest problem. It's one of the reasons why the House in particular has focused so much attention on trying to repeal parts of Obamacare. Because the small business community, larger business community, as they try to grow jobs, they want some certainty, they want some predictability. And the health care law is the number one regulatory issue that they're dealing with as we approach the end of the year. They just don't know if they can invest in their people, they can invest in their equipment because of the cost of health care. And that's where Congress has completely missed the mark, and I think that's where the focus should be. Is it a necessary trade-off if you're going to cover more people so more people have access to health care? Does it have to cost more? No, it doesn't necessarily have to cost more. You know, what we, what we need to focus on in the costs is we've got a 21st century operating room but a 19th century administration. So that's one of the places where we can really move forward and uh, get some cost savings. But again, what we need to do is look at ways at uh, moving forward. Now, taking 33 votes and wasting $50 million of taxpayer time, I just don't find is the, the way to do things. It, it's time we had leaders in Congress who stand up and say, you know what, this isn't perfect, but let's find a way to, to get consensus. Let's come to the table, sit down, come up with ideas, and, and really find a great way to move forward and fix things. All right, well, January is going to be a, a big month because not only will that medical device tax be implemented unless it's repealed uh, ahead of time, uh, the Bush tax cuts are also set to uh, be repealed once again. And it seems every election year in the last several years, we keep talking about this. Uh, Mr. Barnes, what should happen to those tax cuts when they are due to expire in January? Look, the, the first thing we have to realize is we've got a struggling economy and we also have you know, you, you've got uh, a lot of people who are trying to make ends meet. Now, businesses thrive when you've got a strong customer base. But I would be for repealing, uh, letting the Bush era tax cuts expire on those top income earners making more than a million dollars a year if every single dime of it goes towards deficit reduction because it is absolutely imperative that we start reducing our debt and deficit. If the Bush tax cuts uh, do expire, what happens and where do you stand on that? Boy, I, uh, in this tough economy, again, very anemic job growth, uh, we should not be raising taxes on job providers. And even if you look at these so-called top 1% or millionaires uh, paying a higher tax, half of, that business, half of that income is business income. That's a million small businesses. Uh, estimates now show it's going to be a loss of 700,000 jobs, about 14,500 of jobs lost here in Minnesota. That's wrong. And I, there's no economist that's going to agree that's a smart move and a strategic decision in this tough economy. We should not, we should extend those rates. But more importantly, we should move into comprehensive tax reform. You're shaking your head. Obviously, you disagree. Yeah, I disagree. Look, look Tom, I've worked in business. And what creates business growth is demand. It, it's not uh, throwing, throwing money at businesses. When I'm running a business, as I did here in Minnesota, I need customers. And so when we look at uh, economics, a lot of economists are going to say, yeah, what you need is demand. So what we need to focus on is the demand side of things and helping people do better, not just saying, well, those making uh, more than a million dollars are going to magically hand out jobs. Mr. Paulson, the national debt stands at $16 trillion now. Can the nation afford these tax cuts? Well, here's, here, here's the issue. The nation can't afford continued spending. We've got to be spending less. We've got to be living within our means. It's one of my greatest disappointments uh, with the president, to be honest, because we've added $5 trillion to the national debt. Uh, if we stay on this budget path, we're going to double we're doubling the national debt in five years. We're tripling it in 10. We're going to look more like the scary situation that's happening in Greece or in Europe. And so, you know, tax cuts and making the economy worse, uh, if, if we don't have these tax uh, extend, rates extended, the economy is not going to grow. We're not going to bring in more revenue. And are, you, are you disappointed that Congress and the president have not done more to uh, get the debt under control? Absolutely. You know, I, I agree with Congressman Paulson here in that we have to address the debt and deficit, but we need to do so in a responsible manner. Look, part of the reason I got into this race was uh, the whole debt ceiling debacle last summer. And when you have members of Congress who are willing to take a party over country view and vote against raising the debt ceiling limit, 
which, you know, when, when I read the letter from former Congressman Jim Ramstead, who said these flat earthers in Congress are playing with fire, you know, it was pretty sad because what Ramstead was talking about was Congressman Paulson. When, when you're willing to take a vote, and say, you know what, we're not only going to uh, take this party line vote, but we're also going to hurt people, every single person in this country, as well as make it harder to pay off this debt, that's a problem, and we need change. Your response, final Well, remarks. I think he's uh, uh, mischaracterizing the letter that my predecessor wrote. He was referring to people that said they would never, ever, under any circumstance, vote to raise the debt ceiling. My position is you shouldn't give anyone a blank check to raise the debt ceiling. You've got to have spending reforms that are a part of that equation. Now, when Mitt Romney named Paul Ryan as his running mate, he essentially also named a third running mate, and that is the Ryan budget, because that has become uh, one of the biggest issues in the presidential race and in many congressional races. It would fundamentally change the way the Medicare program is administered uh, going forward, while protecting people uh, who are age 55 and older right now. But, Mr. Paulson, do you support the plan? Uh, by Paul Ryan to eventually turn Medicare for future recipients into a, a type of voucher system? Yeah, well, first of all, I supported the budget that passed in the House, which actually, most importantly, not only preserves and protects Medicare for current retirees, but also future retirees. If, if Congress does nothing, Medicare will be bankrupt in 12 years. And so this is about listening to the concerns of seniors and then making adjustments so future retirees will have these programs. And so it's not a voucher system, but it is a premium support system where seniors will have the exact same choices that members of Congress have. So they can choose the plan that best meets their needs, or if they want to stay in traditional Medicare, they can do that as well. Now, Mr. Barnes, on your website, you say that uh, the Ryan Medicare plan would end, would quote, end Medicare as we know it. And Correct. isn't Medicare as we know it going broke anyway? Doesn't it need to be fixed? Look, w when I think about Medicare, I, I think about my parents. I, I think about, uh, you know, a lot of the people here in the district because 15% of our district is over the age of 65. And when you're talking about changing Medicare into a limited voucher system, it could cost up to $6,000 per year per individual. Now, my parents don't have $6,000 more per year that they can throw at their medical costs. I don't think a lot of people have $6,000 just sitting in their pocket. And I think we need to find you know, solutions, bipartisan solutions, to make sure that Medicare doesn't go broke. But we shouldn't uh, sit there and say, well, you're just going to have to pay more. I think that $6,400 figure has been debunked in, in right. some ways because the plan has changed. It was originally about $6,400 it was going to cost, but now it's changed. And I think even the Congressional Budget Office says there are just there are too many unknowns that they don't know exactly what it will cost. But isn't that a problem that there are so many unknowns? Well, that, that is a problem. There's a lot of unknowns, but uh, it's important to point out that uh, that $6,400 uh, number does not include the decrease in quality of care that's a part of the new health care law uh, that's going to ration health care for seniors. And number two, doesn't include the $7,800 that Republicans put in to make sure there's no less quality of care for seniors. So where does this argument go from here? Uh, there have been uh, uh, a lot of people who call uh, Republicans and Democrats on both sides. They, they refer to, whenever they bring up this issue, it's Medicare, it's not Medicare, because they're trying to scare seniors. When in reality, the Ryan budget plan does, again, protect anyone who is 55 years or older. So th these are future uh, people who are going to need this. How, what should happen now? Because something has to happen to save it for the long term? Well, the biggest thing we need is bipartisanship and uh, a consensus in Congress and people willing to stand up, show a little bit of leadership and say, you know, let's sit down the table and figure out some of these unknowns. It, it's scary to me that you put forward a, a budget that has so many unknowns and, and doesn't really look into the details. And I think that's something that the onus is on Congress to sit down and say, you know, let's really hash this out and let's be truthful with the uh, constituents, with the consumers of it, because at the end of the day, you know, we need to take care of them. Whether you're, you're 55 or 65, we're still talking about Medicare. Final word on this. I just think it's important to point out that some of the provisions in the Ryan budget were actually incorporated from Democratic proposals, from uh, Alice Rivlin to uh, Senator Ron Wyden now, who's a very liberal member of the Democratic Senate, who's also proposing the exact same concept so we can save and secure these programs for all retirees. Now, I know the, uh, the 3rd District isn't uh, necessarily a rural district. It has some uh, rural areas in it, but the Farm Bill has been uh, stuck in Congress now for uh, quite some time. Mr. Paulson, you have been there. Why is it so difficult uh, to pass that, and what impact could it have 
on Minnesota farmers and, let's face it, food stamp recipients, since that's what a large portion of that bill is about. Well, I think part of the hang-up has been the reality is that uh, when the farm program gets reauthorized every five years, we got to make sure we reduce direct payments and just direct subsidies. And that's where I think a lot of members, such as myself, are looking for some reforms. We want to make sure we give Minnesota farmers the confidence, not for a three-month farm bill, but a five-year farm bill, for instance, so they can continue to export, they can continue to grow their crops, and then move forward with more forward-thinking leadership rather than sort of a short-term fix. And so that's been part of the hang-up. But we need to have reform of a lot of these spending programs and just not do things the way they've traditionally been done. Uh, well, a lot of Republicans are concerned, too, about the amount of money spent on food stamps. How big of a portion of this is this hang-up? Well, I think just to give food stamps, uh, the reality is that we've increased so much spending on food stamps in the last three and a half, four years. We have more people on food stamps now than ever before. We should look at reforming the program, much like welfare reformed, very successfully, very bipartisanly, to making sure that we're, they're adjusting programs that will save money, but also have people be less self-sufficient on government and food stamps and your uh, view of the farm bill. You know, when we look at the farm bill, I actually applaud the farm bill uh, that's in the House because it does a great job of saying, you know what, we all need to tighten our belt a little bit, and it saves $36 billion, which uh, could, at the end of the day, help reduce the debt and deficit. Now, the problem is, is we've got this farm bill that farmers here in Minnesota need and all over the country, and due to partisan uh, points of view, they're not willing to say, you know what, I might have a problem with it, but let's find out a way to move forward. You know, this, this is absolutely the critical problem we find in Congress, is this extreme partisanship. The Farm Bill is a terrific bill that needs to move forward. It'll help farmers right here in the district, but uh, Congressman Paulson and his party are blocking it. Education reform is another uh, big issue. No Child Left Behind has essentially been left behind. Uh, how, how do we move forward on, on uh, federal education reform? Well, I think it's important to point out that I think our school districts will always do best when local teachers and superintendents and parents are in control. Uh, that means making sure that No Child Left Behind is changed and reformed. I was surprised. I thought that would have been President Obama's number one push or emphasis or priority when he got there was to overhaul No Child Left Behind. Uh, that has unfortunately languished. Uh, it's been divided up into partisanship. Uh, I've met with a lot of my superintendents in the great districts, uh, school districts that I get to represent. and. Uh, they're concerned about the future in that, uh, in, in that area, for instance, and uh, you know, limiting them from having more burdensome regulations on teachers, for instance. Many studies show that the U.S. is falling behind a lot of other countries in terms of education. If you were elected to Congress, what would you do about it? That's correct. And look, we've got some of the best schools in the state, e even in the country here in our district. And it's something to be very proud of. But when we talk about education, the first thing that we have to remember is that businesses are the customer of our educational system. I'm going to say that twice, Tom. Businesses are the customer of our educational system. And so we need to keep that in mind when we start looking at education. Now, I break it into three parts. First, I look at pre-K. Study after study has shown that pre-K programs are immensely successful. I think we need to look at ways at expanding those on the local level. When you start talking about K through 12, there's really only two things because I agree with Congressman Paulson in that it should be left to the local level, but we need to repeal No Child Left Behind and we need to stop at the federal government level this history of unfunded mandates, like special ed, that's a problem. The federal government needs to step up to the plate and quit putting this burden on the local school districts. And then when we start talking about higher education, there's a huge problem here with the rising cost. Look, it's getting so high that we've had more young people drop out of college that we have fallen to 16th in the world, 16th in the world for number of adults with college degrees, and that's a problem. And Democrats have been critical of uh, cuts to some federal aid uh, for higher education. I is that a problem? Well, I supported the extension of keeping loan rates low, but I think more importantly, we shouldn't have cliffs like that that put students in jeopardy. The saddest situation we have today for college graduates is that 50% of college graduates go unemployed because of a really tough economy. And I think our focus in Congress should be job number one, helping grow jobs. Just a couple minutes left, and I don't want to uh, ignore foreign policy. The Obama administration just announced uh, that 33,000 troops that were used in the surge in Afghanistan have now uh, returned back to the United States, but 68,000 troops remain there. And Congressman Paulson, uh, some of your fellow Republicans in Congress have been quoted in recent days as saying it's time to pull all the troops out. Some of the Afghan trained troops and police have actually turned their weapons on U.S. and NATO troops. 
Is it time to get out of Afghanistan? Well, there's no doubt that some of the uh, situations that have happened uh, in the Middle East and around the world clearly show it's a very dangerous world still. I support the uh, plan that's on path right now to have a glide path of having all the troops out by 2014. I think it's also important to listen to the generals around the ground that know the decisions that need to be made to make sure there's safety. That's probably why the troops were just bumped up recently. But as long as we stayed with that glide path to have them all withdrawn in 2014, I'm good with that. We've got them all out of Iraq. We need to get them out of Afghanistan in that same path. Is that too long to keep them there with uh, young men and women uh, dying uh, every week? You know, I, I think we should get out of Afghanistan as fast as a Humvee can drive, actually. You know, I, I've served in the military. My brother served in the military. My father served in the military. Going back five generations, my family has served in the military. And Bill Frenzel and Jim Ramstead before me were both uh, officers in the military. And it takes that kind of understanding from the inside to know, to listen to the generals, the admirals, and what they're really saying. And we can't afford to put more young people more people who could be contributing here at home into harm's path. We need to bring those troops home. All right. Well, I want to thank you both for uh, taking the time to uh, cover a lot of ground uh, in our 30 minutes today. And I wanted to give you each an opportunity uh, to make your case uh, to the, the viewers and the voters at home uh, for why they should uh, vote for you. Uh, in November and Brian Barnes we will start with you you have roughly 30 seconds all right well I'll make it real quick you know we've spent 6.5 million dollars on Congressman Paulson over the past four years and I think about this in business terms of uh, return on investment what have we actually gotten we got somebody who voted against the biggest tax cut this district's ever seen we got somebody who voted against the infrastructure bill that helped build Highway 610, yet he showed up in a hard hat and with a shovel to uh, take the photo op at the groundbreaking, voted against equal pay for women. And I believe that we can do something big here in this next election and actually move forward, but that's going to take strong leadership. And Tom, I truly believe I'm the person to do that for this district. All right, Brian Barnes, he is the DFL candidate for Congress in the 3rd District, and Eric Paulson. Well, and thanks for having us here uh, this morning. Um, look, I mean, I think Minnesotans expect leaders that are going to work across the aisle on some of the challenging issues that are facing our country, and I'm going to pledge my continued effort to do that. 84% of all the bills that I've co-authored and co-sponsored are bipartisan. I've had good working relationships with our Senate colleagues and our House colleagues across the aisle to get things done. In the end, I want to be solution-oriented to focus on job growth. I'm fighting that medical device tax, getting all members united on that. And so I'm going to continue working across the aisle to get things done. And I'm endorsed by local business groups like the Twin West Chamber of Commerce, National Federation of Independent Business, and our law enforcement organizations. All right. Well, again, I want to thank Eric Paulson, the Republican candidate, Brian Barnes, thank the Democratic candidate, for taking the time out of your busy campaign schedules uh, to appear. I think it's very important uh, that viewers at home and uh, obviously the voters get a chance to find out where you both stand on the very important issues facing this country. So again, Mr. Barnes, Mr. Paulson, thank you for being here. And we want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this debate between the major party candidates for Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District. Again, this uh, is a very important uh, time in this country, and we hope you can all get out and vote in November. And we will see you soon on the campaign trail. I'm Tom Hauser for 5 Eyewitness News.